Hello, everybody. Let me turn this camera around. I know it's a bit of an odd day to be doing a live, but lots of people have asked me recently uh, about the resins that I sell, which are these resins. I sell them in one liter containers like this on my website. Uh, I also sell them with kits, with uh, resin, uh, resin blank kits for knife making uh, and lots of uh, different mica powders and colors. So yeah, people have been mentioning it. I thought, why don't I just quickly do a live? Now, this is all thrown together last minute. I'm recording on my phone, so that's who knows how good this is actually going to be, but I'll do my very darndest to uh, keep the camera steady and whatnot. Uh, okay, so what I'm doing today is I'm casting some uh, handle blanks for these little paring knives that I've been doing. Uh, and if any of you have looked on my website at any point, you will see the castings uh, that I did last time for them. And there's one particular that had uh, a crystal type finish to it on a bit of Australian burl. And several people really like that. And I've had a customer ask on this batch of paring knives to have uh, one of those handles. So I'm doing that at the moment. I'm doing it a little bit differently. So what I actually do with this, uh, this resin and this mica powder is I do what's called wetting. I make a tiny little amount of it and I put a really concentrated level of uh, mica powder into it. And then you start to get almost like a paste. That way you get a really good mix. Some mica powders don't mix as well as others. Um, and what I found is some of the ones that really have a lovely finish when they're done don't mix so well in the start. So this is a pretty industry standard thing to do called wetting. Now, you don't have to do it with a lot of other brands like Alumalite doesn't require it um, really, but I've just got in the habit of doing it. So my mica powders, which come like this, they actually work better. You can do them without, but I tend to find they work better by doing them as a, uh, via wetting. So this, what I'm doing right now is I'm just mixing small batches. So this one's a little small batch here. And what I'm gonna do differently this time, to last time is, last time I just used this, and this is the uh, Lumalite and it's the pearlescent powder. Now, pearlescent powder looks like a crystal when it's done. It looks gorgeous. So in, in that state, it's quite concentrated. But once it's in a clear resin, it comes up really well. The nice thing about this resin that I sell is it doesn't need a pressure pot. It has a long curing time, which means it, it has time for the bubbles to leave. And it doesn't require uh, the, uh, the, the pressure pot to get rid of those bubbles. What that does mean is when you cast several colors together, you can get a little bit of a blurring between the colors as opposed to them staying completely separate because it doesn't cure as fast as a lot of things like Lumalite, which is another one I use, which cures in about 10 minutes and it freezes time exactly how you, you cast it. So there's that one. And then this one's got a little tiny bit of resin in it too. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop a tiny little bit of my 24 karat gold mica powder into this one so I can mix that in and uh, do what I was just discussing a minute ago, which is called wetting. So even though it's a really small amount, you use quite a bit of powder because it's obviously going to then be diluted when it goes into the larger batch of resin. So I just mix that. You can see there's like very little liquid in there in comparison. I just mix that together until it becomes one sort of cohesive uh, consistency, no lumps nothing that are going to cause issues later. Nice thing about this also is if you want to get some nice streaks in it in a clear resin or another color, doing like this is highly concentrated. And when you put it into your other resins, you actually find that you can get it so that it's got beautiful heavy gold or whatever color you're choosing with this mica powder. Uh, you can choose to have streaks running through the clear resin, basically. So, this resin, like I say, it doesn't require a pressure point. It does take a long time to go off. Left it in the freezing cold, a small amount. It might take even a couple of days to go off. I put mine in a pressure pot so that I don't have issues with the bubbles. And then I put a heater on it. It really only takes a couple of hours. So, um, you don't have that same issue. So that one's pretty well mixed. I'm happy with that. There's no lumps or bumps in it. So, hey, Paul, how you doing, mate? Hey, James. So now I'm going to mix a larger batch because I want to be able to put it in these two blanks that I'm doing. So what I've decided to do here is do two slightly different style ones. So 
because they're for a paring knife, it's only going to be quite thin, which you can see that's about 30 mil thick. And that's all you require with a paring knife. This one is much thicker. Uh, it's These are both stabilized in cactus juice. It's much thicker. This will be a bigger block. And what it could mean is that I end up doing... Uh, um, hey, Darren, how you doing, mate? I could end up doing a larger block, which I can use for another knife. Or I might even whack it on my website. If anyone's interested in that one, I might put it on my website tomorrow or something along those lines. So that's what they're going to be for. So... You can calculate exactly how much resin you're going to require. Uh, Toby's a little bit lazy about how he does that. I tend, to, I tend to just wing it uh, because I always have spare molds around and I just make up other things. So often I'll have like blocks made up. And even if I leave it in the cup and throw it in the pressure pot, you get some pretty cool things you can use later like this. Have lots of these. And so what I do sometimes is if I'm making a knife and I decide I want to bolster on it and I go, oh, that was the color. I can slice it in half and actually take that piece. Same as that. This one's one of the uh, the coffee, the latte blocks I do. If I ever wanted an extra piece, I can I can steal that bit out of there. This one's a glow in the dark green. So it's always nice to have little extras that you can throw onto stuff. Uh, so never leave the resin to waste. Use it, use it up. Uh, in a pot and let it cure so at least you can work with it later on right i'm just going to clean this one out a little bit so i put it on my scales these are just cheap scales like a ebay jobby scales um and then i am going to mix up my next batch of resin and the nice thing about this having a big open time is i'm not scared <laughs> Whereas things like Illumilite, right now, for me to have this conversation with you would be insane. It would have all gone off in these pots. This little amount would have gone off in these pots while I was playing with it. So, hi, Matt. How you doing? So, I don't have to worry about that with this batch, which is awesome. So, this resin mixes a three to one instead of things like Illumilite that are a two to one. So, thinking about how much I'm going to want in here, I'm probably going to do uh, about 150 of the part A which is, what is that, 60, no, that's 50. If I did like 175, that'd be 66, about 66, something along those lines. So because I'm not great at maths, I'll probably do, see what, 150 of this and 50 of that is. That's 200, that's three to one. And uh, for simpletons like myself, it makes it really easy. I could easily get a calculator out and do it, but yeah, that's no fun. You want to make sure it's pretty close. Like people give you the numbers, they don't have to be like, exactly two to one or whatever but what what it will be the further out it is it'll mess with the final cure or it'll mess with the speed at which it cures and sometimes you can get it to go hard but it stays ever so slightly your elasticity is too high and it's sort of ever so slightly robbery or something along those lines that feels like that's not enough so i'm going to go a bit more The nice thing about casting your own resins is if you don't have enough, you can always pour in more later. I mean, sometimes it's pretty cool having the differences in mixes. So that's 176. Correct me if I'm wrong before I go and screw this up. That should be, 175 should be 66.6, something along those lines, 66, 120, 132, 180, 90. No, that's not right, is it? 56. Come on, someone with a calculator. What's, what's 175 divided by three? Come on, 175 divided by three. 50, 25, 27, something like that. So 67, yeah, so 66, I was right. 66.6, do that, 66.6. Oh, it's filling everywhere, Tobe. Okey-dokey. There's a little bit over there, but actually what I've got is I've got it all over here, so it throws the scales out. Now it's changed the scale anyway, so it doesn't make any difference. All right, and then, like I say, I've got lots of time with this resin. 
which makes it perfect for beginners. You don't have to stress out about how long you have to mix it up. So let's get rid of the scales. So you, st you want to mix really, really well. And you can see as I'm mixing, it goes quite cloudy. And that's because obviously there's two different materials in there. But when you keep mixing, it'll start going clear again. And what you want is no streaks, no lines and like that. And you will get bubbles by mixing rapidly like this. But that's what, like I say, the beauty of this stuff is we're not worried about bubbles. Um, if you're going to put a heater against it, you have to consider those bubbles a little bit more because if you've got it really hot, it could, uh, Brody, how you doing, man? It could, uh, 59, oh, yeah, yeah, we put 60-something. 59 is close enough. So what will happen is because this is the activator, it'll cure a little bit faster because essentially I put uh, was seven more grams of the part B in than required. So divide it up over the three, that's only two and a bit. So per, like per, so, so we're all good. Probably should have turned these notifications off because now it's peeing. All right. So you want to scrape the side. See, I'm like flat against the side, scraping it. And some people cut the bottom of this off square to so get right on the edges. I still feel like you can get in there absolutely fine, right into the bottom. And if this was a Lumalite, at this point now, when I'm pretty happy with the mix, I would be sticking it in another cup. I'd be decanting it into a new cup and then remixing it. But because of the fact I have all the time in the world, I can really get right in the bottom corners and make sure I'm scraping out everything. So that now, you can see there's some bubbles in there, but there's no sort of stringy lines. And you'll know if you're not done, because every time you scrape the sides, you'll get sort of stringy lines appear in the resin itself, which when that stops happening, you're golden. So let's keep going with this. Like I say, we've got all the time in the world with this one. We're super happy to just play with it. So I'm pretty good with that. That's all mixed up. I'm gonna put some of this into the gold and the rest of it into the crystal. So I'm not putting much gold in at all. So I'm only just going to put a drizzle in there just so I can mix that through a little further later on. But then the rest of it's all going to go into this one. Um, give my kids in the background. So we're mixing that all together. Make sure we get lots of that out of there. Now, if you leave this cup on, a, on an angle, up against something it'll all slowly run to one corner which means you get a nice solid clump in the bottom and it's actually quite easy to pull out afterwards so now when i mix this through you can see that pearlescent will start to mix in amongst all of it if you see that looks gorgeous and you start to get that crystal look that i had in those last blanks that people liked and the nice thing about this is it looks pretty dense but like you can see the stick through it without really any issue it actually becomes really close to see-through when you grind down to a 20 mil round handle or 30 mil round handle. The only thing you have to be a bit careful of that is when you are doing like a wire handle or if you've got a, uh, a full tang, you want to put a liner in it unless you want to be able to see the steel through it, which that's down to you. If you've got nice pretty steel or you've done a file knife and you want to be able to see the file through it, this can look really cool without just being fully clear. So that's nicely mixed. This one is our gold one. It's gonna, as you can see, that hasn't mixed naturally of its own. So we're just now going to mix that together to pick up the gold. Uh, except Toby's an idiot and he poured it into yesterday's gold pot, not today's gold pot. I'm wondering why it's not mixed. I'm going, that's crazy. It's not mixed. So let's try that again. Let's decant that into this gold pot. What happens when you don't finish cleaning up your uh, stuff from yesterday? <laughs> you get confused as to what's what. So this gold, the reason I'm doing a tiny bit is because as a bit of a change from the last one, the customer who asked for this knife likes gold. So on the last one, we had a bright, big, thick brass bolster, and it looked gorgeous. But I wonder if a couple of tiny wisps of gold in amongst the crystal will really just tie it together with the brass bolster. So. Um, 
Okie dokie. So now I'll mix this one together. Nice and goldy goldy. Whatever his name is out of uh, Austin Powers. Gold. All right. Nicely mixed together. So let's pour it into the timber block now. So you can see that's staying all in solution. Once it's in solution, it's not going to separate. Like you don't have to worry about it because it takes so long separating, um, in my experience. So this is nice and warm. Because of the fact that I want this to go off a bit quicker, I and I try to get any va uh, vapor out of the timber, even though it's stabilized, there'll be some on the surface and some on the silicon. So this has been in the oven at like 40 degrees Celsius for about 25 minutes. Um, you can actually wait the blocks in the oven at like 90 degrees Celsius if you wanted. Uh, and it would it would sort of help with the process. Okay, let's move this over here and start pouring in. Okay, okay. Let's get another, another glove on. So this one, because it's one colour, I'm just pouring it in. So this one's the first, the most important one that I wanted. It's just the, the one of that customer, although who knows, I may end up using the other one. So you can see that's a really cool crystal -y sort of colour. And then this one could end up with one that I put for sale. Now, because it's deeper, I'm going to put in a bit like that. And then I'm going to put in a tiny little couple of wisps of gold. Not much at all. And then using our little gold stick. Give it just a tiny bit of love. And then more of the clear on top. So because I've done that in there, I don't want to hold this too high because if I hold it up, it'll actually plunge straight to the bottom and it will bring the gold to the surface, which is not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to leave that near the bottom um, so that it doesn't rise up with it. So okay, there's a bit more. I'm going to stick a bit more gold in. Maybe go in this one. So let's move that gold around a little bit. The gold in this one, we want to try to get to the bottom a bit because it's not as deep. But we know we're going to get to the top and the bottom without too much issue. He says. Right, so a little bit more of the you can use the this crystal one to agitate the gold even further. So I tend to put more in than you think you're gonna need depth wise because obviously it, it's gonna go in and around the timber block too. And that will absorb a certain amount of it because it's sort of hiding behind it. You can see over here, this one's sort of running over the top and starting to soak down. It would do that anyway underneath. And if the block floats a little tiny bit or anything like that, not that it should float because it's stabilised, but if it moves at all under the pressure or anything, you don't really want to be fighting with the fact that it's uh, that it's got underneath it and you kind of lose some of the usability of the, of the actual blank itself. So I'm just taking the last little bits out of here. So I've used it. do you still need to vacuum chamber with this resin? No, you don't. Because of the fact that it has so long for the bubbles to rise to the top, you're actually completely fine without a vacuum chamber. So I don't vacuum it. I pressurize it. But I've left these blocks in the past out without any form of um, the, in no vacuum, no pressure, and been absolutely fine. So... No, you're all good there. 
that's the beauty of this one. It just, and that, and that's the reason sort of not just for beginners because I use it myself, but it, it is great for beginners because they can obviously when things like pressure pots and vacuum chambers obviously aren't cheap. They're, it's quite a, a big addition and I would rather people that can learn this stuff without having to buy that. So that's the reason I make what I make. I sell these. This is one of my seconds, this silicon mold. It's something that I stuffed up and I wasn't happy with. So this one never got sold, but I sell these for 88 Australian dollars each, which is obviously pretty dirt cheap in my opinion, considering the resin itself for this, something like this pinky seal resin is about 68, $70 worth of resin in that actual mold. So I do other types of the colors like this one here is my mint green one. And I, nobody seems to mind, but I tend to just do whatever color I fancy at the time. Uh, and they're very, very high quality. They're, they're solid. They've got a nice thick wall. Like they don't, don't bend under their own, under the weight of the vacuum. Cause that's the weight of the uh, resin. Cause a lot of them do that. I've, I've seen them in the past and people, you have to build like a wooden frame or some sort of uh, frame around it to stop this doing this or doing this. And if it does this, you end up with these funny shaped blanks. So what doesn't hurt with this resin is if you've got something like a Banksia pod, like this one, these are something that I've been working on also for that same customer. These are Banksia pod. And so because there's a lot of air in this, especially if you're not going to be using a vacuum chamber or pressure pot, you want to really agitate this inside the resin, even pick it up, move it around, really pour it into the holes, play with it. And so you can get, get it out of those spots. Uh, and then, and then obviously you, you're pretty confident that you will have filled all those holes. The really cool thing about casting your own resins is if you do use your handle later on and you find that there's a little hole in it, there's nothing stopping you knocking up a little bit with the same color in it or very similar. And then filling those holes. That's the beauty of doing things on your own. So I sell these as well. Like this with a one liter of resin and two colors, two choice of micro powders, but like a, I think 120 Australian dollars. Again, I don't make a lot out of that, but it just means you can, there's nothing stopping you as a complete novice just going, okay, I want to cast some handles. And one liter of resin uh, will do at least four blocks, depending on how big your blocks are. I, I have this rebate at the top, which I've never, I haven't seen anyone else do before, and it just allows you a bit of slop space instead of them being just enough height and then it runs over the top just when it's, if it's not right. So let's see if we can do this one handed. And like I say, I, cause I do have a pressure pot and I apply heat to it. Like I literally apply with that heater to the side of one of my pressure pots. Let's see if we can do this one handed without going all over the place. Oh, I almost lost it. So what I do want with this one is that that bit of block is a little bit too thick for what I'm going to want, but I don't mind there being a bit more at this end because I'm going to taper the handle. So in this case, I'm going to tip it down that way. Now I can see this is running. It's ever so slightly off level that way. I can adjust it by just moving my plastic. It's, I left this a little small because it's on a concave. So I can actually move it just to get it level and out of level. And then that way, the thickest end is going to be here, which normally you don't want that. Normally you want it perfectly level, but when you're making your own, you can make them as custom as you like. So I'm pretty happy with that. I've got a nice bit of resin on my hand. And then, so because I use a big chamber, let me see if I can put you down somewhere against the mill. Sorry, I hope that's not too bad for everybody. Now, a lot of these pressure pots, like the small ones I have over the other side, they run up to 60 PSI. This one runs up to 80, but a lot of them only run up to 40. And 40 is still way better than a poke in the eye of a blunt stick. It's going to crush those bubbles because all the pressure pot's doing is actually making those bubbles that say, obviously not this big, but that big under, uh, like it's atmospheric pressure is 14 PSI. So if you can times that by three, you're crushing those bubbles so much smaller that they're actually smaller than the human eye can take. So when you're going up to 60, even 40, 60, 80, whatever you're casting at, you, there's no need to go over 60 really. I don't know of any 
uh, any um, resins that actually require you to go over 60. But when you do, you crush the bubble so small that the human eye can't pick it up. So it's still there technically. Whereas a vacuum pot helps to remove it and take it out uh, uh, to a big extent. If you put it in the vacuum chamber and leave it in there, it'll actually start to, um, I think it's more like a chemical reaction, but it creates a vapor and it, it goes incredibly bubbly. It goes psycho. And you get something that looks like, this is an experiment I did a while ago because a lot of people ask me about uh, what happens when you put it in a pressure pot. And you can actually see this, all the bubbles disappeared in this and then started to come back. And actually they, they were in there until it cured. And I left it in the vacuum chamber fully and it cured with all these crazy lines in it. And so I'm intending at some point, you see the yellow reflection off the thing, making the yellow, to actually drill a couple of holes in this, find them and then fill it blue or something crazy and just have fun with a bolster or something with it. But um, that's why I don't use a vacuum chamber. Some people successfully do. I've never put heaps of energy into it, so I don't. Um, again, it's the reason I created this or started using this resin. So this is going to get a little noisy. So I don't just whack the air in, like fully leave it open, just bam, and just let it fly in there because you can actually get the air hit the hit the uh, top of the resin and it blows like the surface tension and just split it everywhere. I've made that mistake before. Ended up with pink all inside my my uh, pressure pot. So. All I do now is the the, the chamber is uh, the uh, compressor is on. I just let mine in relatively slowly, unless you have a baffle in it. So I used that thing over there. It's like a three level system, and I put it on the bottom one and the top one. And then so so several companies actually make them now with a the lid on them, and so you can blast this in as fast as you want. But and with a loom a lot, I'm a bit crazier about speed wise. But with with this stuff. You know, so sorry about that, it's very noisy. And I have this preset to 70 PSI because this is this is tested at 80, the pot, but why ever push it right to its last limits? That wouldn't be any fun. So I let it, you can see over here, it's at 60 and that's 80. So when it gets to 70, it'll automatically start switching itself off. But either way, I still remove, hang on. I've heard of people before who leave these connected and these valves open just in case they have a leak on the pot. I do not like the idea of that one bit. I always turn my valves off and disconnect mine. I don't have any leaks, but even if I did, I'd rather it leaked than who knows, the this failing or something and it pumping in 100 PSI or whatever into a pot that can't take it. So anyway. So that is how I cast my with my resins. Uh, I hope you got something out of that. If you liked it and, you, and you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Uh, I will do much more of these lives, I think, because it's sometimes easy just to do this for 10 minutes and people can learn something and I can share a bit of information. Uh, if you liked the live, please leave a comment, ask any questions, happy to answer any questions about my resin. In fact, any resins I've used, most of the resins, liquid diamonds, alumalite, crystal cast, uh, name them i'll probably use them happy to ask any questions please give me a holler thank you very much uh i'll see you on the next one